maximum and minimum values. Let C be a number in the domain of a function f. f of C is the absolute maximum of the function f if f of C is greater than or equal to f of x for all x in the domain. f of C is the absolute minimum value of f if f of C is less than or equal to f of x for all x in the domain. This definition is fairly intuitive. It basically just says to be the absolute maximum value of a function, it has to be the highest point, and to be the absolute minimum value, it has to be the lowest point. We have another type of maximum and minimum. f of c is a local maximum of a function f if f of c is bigger than f of x when x is near c, and it's a local minimum when f of c is less than f of x when x is near c. The graph here will provide some context. So I want you to notice in terms of absolute maximums and minimums, we have an absolute maximum here at this point because this is the highest point on the entire function. And we have an absolute minimum at this point. And again, this is because this is the lowest point on the entire function. However, we have some other points that are local maximums or minimums. So I want you to notice that this point right here is a local max. And it's a local max because this point is higher than all the points immediately around it. But it is not an absolute max because it's not higher than these points over here. We also have a local minimum right here for the same reason. So this point is lower than all the points immediately around it. And we have a local minimum over here. For the same reason. Now, it's important to point out that this point right here is not a local max. And the reason for this is because there are only points to one side of it. To be a local maximum, it has to be higher than all the points near that point on both sides of that point. Now, what we need to do is find out how to find these maximums and minimums. So let's take a fresh look at that graph. I want you to notice that at the absolute maximum here, the local maximum here, and the local minimum here, all of those points have something in common, and that is the slope of the tangent line is equal to zero at all of those points. So we have f prime of d is 0, f prime of e is 0, and f prime of b is 0. So if we're looking for maximums and minimums, it seems that we are interested in when f prime of x would be 0. But also, I want you to see that at this point right here, f prime of c does not exist. And that is because it comes to a sharp point here. So the slopes of the tangent line from this side are not the same as the slopes of the tangent lines from the other side. And that point is also a local minimum. So when we are looking for local maximums and minimums, we are looking for when the derivative is 0 and also when the derivative does not exist. 
And we'll say more about this in just a little bit to make this more, uh, more precise. But for now, I just want you to have an intuition on where this is headed. The extreme value theorem guarantees that if f is a continuous function on a closed interval from a to b, then it must attain an absolute maximum value and an absolute minimum value at some numbers in the interval from a to b. I have some diagrams here to help us understand this theorem. So in the first diagram, notice that we have a continuous function on the closed interval from A to B. Now, closed just means that the endpoints are included. And continuous means that I can draw this without lifting my pen off the paper. Now, I want you to notice that in this particular situation, we have an absolute maximum value here, and we have an absolute minimum value here. And so, we're guaranteed to have this at some numbers C and D in your interval. Now in the second drawing, I want you to notice that again, we have an absolute maximum value at C, but now our minimum value is actually at the end point B. So it is possible for your maximum or minimum to not occur somewhere in the middle. It might occur at the end. And you can see this uh, in the last one, that you can see that we have two maximums, right? Those are level with each other, and one minimum. And so you might even have more than one point at which the maximum and minimum values occur. So now let's talk about how you actually find these values. To find the absolute maximum and minimum values of a continuous function on a closed interval, we use the closed interval method. Step one, find the values of f at the critical numbers of f in the interval from a to b. I have not defined critical numbers yet, but I will in just a moment. Then find the values of f at the endpoints of the interval. And then simply compare these values, the largest values, is your absolute maximum value, and the smallest is the absolute minimum value. Now let's talk about critical numbers. First, let's state Fermat's theorem. If f has a local maximum or minimum at the value c, and if f prime of c exists, then f prime of c must be zero. So this says if you have a local maximum or a local minimum, and if the function is differentiable at that point, then the slope of the tangent line must be zero. However, we know from previous diagrams that when the derivative is zero is not the only time you could have a maximum or a minimum. So now let's define critical numbers. A critical number of a function f is a number c in the domain of f such that f prime of c is zero or f prime of c does not exist. So if you take a look at this diagram, we can see that x equals b, x equals d, and x equals e are all critical numbers because the slope of the tangent line is zero. And x equals c is also a critical number because f prime of c does not exist. And all of these are important points to consider because you have local maximums and minimums at all of these points. So the last thing here, if f has a local maximum or minimum at c, then c must be a critical number of f. Please understand that this does not say that a critical number always gives you a maximum or a minimum. Rather, it says if you have a maximum or a minimum, it must occur, occur at a critical number. So finding critical numbers is very important because if you have local maximums and minimums, 
that is where they will occur. Okay, let's go back and do some examples now of the extreme value theorem. Find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum values of the function f on the given interval. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is find the critical numbers. So to find the critical numbers, we need the derivative. f prime of x here is 12x to the third minus 48x squared plus 36x. And I'm going to set this equal to zero because critical numbers occur when the derivative is zero. Now they also occur when the derivative is undefined, but this function is never undefined. So I will solve this by factoring. I can factor out a greatest common factor of 12x. And then we can factor the remaining quadratic. And the solutions to this equation are 0, 1, and 3. And so these are our critical numbers. Now, the first step said to find the function value at each of these critical numbers. So we're going to plug 0 into the function, which is pretty simple. When you plug 0 in here, you get f of 0 is 0. Then we shall plug in 1. Now, when you plug in 1 here, you get 3 times 1 to the 4th minus 16 times 1 cubed plus 18 times 1 squared, and this ends up being 5. And finally, we'll do f of 3. And I think I'll show my work on this one. This is 3 times 3 to the 4th minus 16 times 3 cubed plus 18 times 3 squared. And this is 3 times 81 minus 16 times 27 plus 18 times 9. And this is 243 minus 432 plus 162, which equals negative 27. Okay, so we now know f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 5, and f of 3 is negative 27. Step 2 says to find the function value at the endpoints of your interval. Now your endpoints are negative 1 and positive 4. So we're going to do f of negative 1 and f of positive 4. And you do these the same way that you calculate here. So I'm just going to write down these results. And so f of negative 1 is 37 and f of 4 is 32. And now to find the absolute maximum and minimum values, you only need to compare the y values of all of these points. So if you look at all of these, I think it is pretty clear that this is your maximum value because 37 is higher than all of these values here. And this is your minimum value because negative 27 is less than all of the other numbers. So we're going to say f of negative 1 is equal to 37 is the absolute maximum, and f of 3 equals negative 27 is the absolute minimum. And here is a picture of that function. So it is a polynomial function. And you can see very clearly the absolute minimum is down here. f of 3 equals negative 27. And the absolute maximum occurs at the left end point. f of negative 1 equals 37. In our next example, we want to find the absolute maximum and minimum values of the function f equals 2 cosine t 
plus sine of 2t on the interval from 0 to pi over 2. So first, we need to find the derivative. So f prime of t is going to be 2 times negative sine of t plus the cosine of 2t multiplied by 2. So that's the chain rule there. This simplifies to be negative 2 sine of t plus 2 cosine of 2t. Okay, step one, we have to find our critical numbers. Our critical numbers occur when the derivative is equal to zero, and that means negative two times sine of t plus two times the cosine of two t must be equal to zero. So now we have to review solving trig equations. When you're solving a trig equation, you need the angles of your trig functions to be equal. And these are different. So this is no good. So we're going to remember that cosine of 2t is equal to an identity. It's actually three identities. One is that it's cosine squared of t minus sine squared of t. It's also equal to 2 cosine squared of t minus 1. And finally, it's also equal to 1 minus 2 sine squared of t. Now, of these three formulas, the one that I'm going to use to replace cosine of 2t is going to be the last one. And the reason I'm going to replace this with this is because then I will have all signs, because this function here is already a sine function. So we have negative 2 sine of t plus 2 times 1 minus 2 sine squared of t is equal to 0. And now if I just multiply this out, you can see, if nothing else, we now at least have the same angle in our trig function. And this is very important. So now we'll go ahead and continue to solve. I'm going to put negative 4 sine squared of t first, negative 2 sine of t second, and positive 2, and then equals 0. And we can solve this first by factoring out a negative 2. which gives us this equation. And then we can finish this by factoring the quadratic here. And this factor is like any other quadratic except that your variable is sine of t. Oh, and this should be squared. So when I factor it, it's 2 sine of t times 1 sine of t. And then we know it has to be 1 times 1. And then to make everything work, we need a negative here and a positive there. And then I'm going to set each of these factors equal to 0. Solving for sine of t here, we get sine of t equals 1 half. Solving for sine of t here, we get sine of t equals negative 1. Now, allow me to go back to the beginning here and point out that the interval of interest for us is from 0 to pi over 2. So this means that t has to be an angle between 0 and pi over 2. So this really helps us because that means that your angle t has to be in the first quadrant. So let's think, where is sine of t equal to 1 half? Well, we should know that this happens at 30 degrees, which is the same as pi over 6. And then when does sine of t equal negative 1? In the first quadrant, this does not happen. Sine of t is not negative 1 anywhere between 0 and pi over 2. So the only critical number we have is pi over 6. So the next step is find the function value at your critical number. So I need to plug pi over 6 into the original function here. So let's plug in pi over 6, so we get 
2 cosine of pi over 6 plus sine of 2 times pi over 6. And this is equal to 2 times radical 3 over 2 plus, now that becomes sine of 2 pi over 6, which is pi over 3. And so we have 2 radical 3 over 2 plus, and then sine of pi over 3 is radical 3 over 2. So this is 3 radical 3 over 2. And so we'll save that. Step 2, let's plug in our endpoints. So f of 0 is going to be 2 cosine of 0 plus the sine of 2 times 0. Sine of 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. And so this becomes 2 times 1, which is 2. And f of pi over 2 is 2 cosine of pi over 2 plus sine of 2 times pi over 2. And let's remember the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. And also right here, these cancel out. And so you just get the sine of pi. But the sine of pi is also 0. So now step 3, we can identify our absolute maximum and our absolute minimum by simply looking at these three values and observing which is largest and which is smallest. So clearly 0 is the smallest. So the absolute minimum occurs at f of pi over 2 equals 0. And the absolute maximum is this value. It turns out that 3 times square root of 3 divided by 2 is a little bit bigger than 2. So the absolute maximum is f of pi over 6 equals 3 radical 3 divided by 2. And here is a graph just for visual confirmation. You can see your function here from x equals 0 to x equals pi over 2. This is your minimum value here, and this is your maximum value here. And 3 radical 3 over 2 is approximately 2.598. Find the absolute maximum and absolute minimum values of f on the given interval. So this function here is t minus the q root of t, and the interval is from negative 1 to 4. So let me first write f of t as t minus t to the 1 third. And now the derivative will be 1 minus 1 third t to the negative 2 thirds, which is 1 minus 1 third times 1 over t to the 2 thirds. And this can be simplified to 1 minus 1 over 3t to the 2 thirds. Okay, step number one. We need our critical numbers. So your critical numbers here, right away, I can see is going to be t equals 0. And that is because when you plug 0 in here, this will be undefined. And that makes f prime of t undefined. And very importantly, 0 is in the original domain. So this is our first critical number. Now we also get a critical number when our derivative is equal to 0. So to solve this equation, I'm going to add the fraction to the other side. And then I'm going to express 1 as 1 over 1 and then cross multiply. So 1 times 3t to the 2 thirds is 3t to the 2 thirds. And 1 times 1 is 1. And then if I divide by 3, I get t to the 2 thirds equals 1 third. And now to solve for t, what I'm going to do is raise this to the 3 over 2 power. And then whatever I do to the left side, I have to do the same thing to the right side. And the reason you do this is because when you have a power to a power, you're going to multiply those powers. And when you do 2 thirds times 3 halves, everything cancels out here and you just get t. 
And then on the other side, you have the square root of one third cubed. So we have t equals, the square root of one is one, the square root of three is the square root of three, and then cubed. And this is going to be one cubed over the square root of three cubed. And this is one over three radical three. And then if you rationalize the denominator, you will get radical three over nine. And one other point, which is very important here, is this is going to be plus or minus. And that is because when you take the square root of a square, you always get the plus or minus, right? So just a quick example, if I have x squared is equal to 81, when I take the square root of x squared and the square root of 81, what happens here is this becomes the absolute value of x, and then that means that x can equal plus or minus. So anytime you have a square root of a square, you have to remember to put plus or minus on the other side. Okay, so now our critical numbers are t equals 0, and t equals negative radical 3 over 9, and positive radical 3 over 9. And all of these critical numbers are relevant to us because all three of these numbers are in between negative 1 and 4. So the next step is to plug your critical numbers into the function. So we need to do f of 0, f of radical 3 over 9, and f of negative radical 3 over 9. F of 0 is very simple to compute. When you plug 0 in here, you get 0 minus 0 to the 1 third, which of course is 0. F of radical 3 over 9 will be radical 3 over 9 minus radical 3 over 9 to the 1 third. And this is radical 3 over 9 minus the cube root of radical 3 over 9. And this gets to be a little bit of work here. When you have the cube root of the square root of 3, this is going to be the same as the sixth root of 3. Okay, and the reason for that is because you have 3 to the 1 half to the 1 third, which becomes 3 to the 1 sixth. So what we have here is the sixth root of 3 and then the cube root of 9 in the bottom. And now if I simplify this further, what I can do here is express these all as powers of 3. So let me just focus on the 6th root of 3 over the cube root of 9. So this is 3 to the 1 6th, and the cube root of 9 is 3 squared, to the 1 third. And this is 3 to the 1 sixth over 3 to the 2 thirds. And if I subtract exponents, I get 1 sixth minus 2 thirds. And if you do the math on that, you get negative 1 half. And 3 to the negative 1 half is 1 over radical 3. So to say this succinctly here, this ends up being 1 over radical 3. So we have the square root of 3 over 9 minus 1 over the square root of 3. And then I'm going to multiply by radical 3 and radical 3. And that is going to give me radical 3 over 9 minus radical 3 over 3. And then finally, I'll multiply by 3 over 3. And this gives us radical 3 minus 3 radical 3, which is negative 2 radical 3, over the common denominator of 9. And let me just say, when you plug in negative radical 3 over 9, you are going to get the opposite of what we just got. So let's summarize. So we have f of 0 equals 0, 
f of radical 3 over 9 is negative 2 radical 3 over 9, and f of negative radical 3 over 9 is 2 radical 3 over 9. Okay, now we have to compute the function values at the endpoints. So here we need to do f of negative 1, which is going to be negative 1 minus the cube root of negative 1, which is negative 1 minus negative 1, which is 0. And we also have to do f of 4, which is going to be 4 minus the cube root of 4. Okay, so now we got to figure out what's our maximum and what's our minimum. So if you look at all of these values here, it's pretty clear that negative 2 radical 3 over 9 is your minimum because it's the only negative number. And then it's only a matter of which of these two is bigger. Well, it turns out 4 minus the cube root of 4 is larger than 2 cube root of 9 over 9. So our absolute maximum is f of 4 equals 4 minus the cube root of 4. And our absolute minimum is f of radical 3 over 9, which is equal to negative 2 radical 3 over 9. And let's take a look at the graph. So here you can see f of radical 3 over 9 is this value right here. That's our absolute minimum. And f of 4 is this value. That is our absolute maximum. In the last two examples, I just want to talk about finding critical numbers. There's a couple of important distinctions that we need to make. So here we have g of x is the cube root of 4 minus x squared. First, I'll rewrite g of x as 4 minus x squared quantity to the 1 -third power. g prime of x will be 1 -third times 4 minus x squared to the negative 2 thirds times the derivative of the inside, which is negative 2x. And this can be rewritten as negative 2x over 3 times 4 minus x squared to the 2 thirds power. Now to find critical numbers, we need to think about when the derivative is equal to 0. If the derivative is a fraction, the only way a fraction can equal 0 is if the numerator of the fraction is 0. So we only need to think about when is negative 2x equal to 0. And of course, this is true when x equals 0. But also for critical numbers, we need to think about when does our derivative not exist? Well, not exist usually means the denominator will equal 0. And we know that if we set 4 minus x squared equal to 0, we get 4 equals x squared, and I think it's pretty clear that x has to be positive or negative 2. And so these would also be critical numbers. And let me make this very clear. The reason these are all critical numbers is because, number one, they are all in the domain of the function. So you can plug 0 into this function, and you can plug 2 and negative 2 into this function. If any of these numbers had not been in the domain, they cannot be critical numbers. So in this case, all three of these are critical numbers. Now let's consider this example. Again, find the critical numbers. First thing I'm going to do here is rewrite my function h of x by multiplying this out. So I have x to the negative 1 third times x minus 2 times x to the negative 1 third. Now, x is the same as x to the 1. So this becomes x to the negative 1 third plus 1, which is 2 thirds, and then minus 2x to the negative 1 third. And I'm going to rewrite this as x to the 2 thirds minus 2 divided by 
x to the one-third. Again, this is our original function. So first, notice that no matter what happens here, x cannot be 0. Let's keep that in mind as we calculate our derivative. Now, for our derivative, h prime of x, let me go ahead and use this format to find our derivative. So the derivative is going to be 2 thirds x to the negative 1 third minus 2 times negative 1 third x to the negative 4 thirds. So again, here I'm just using the power rule, bringing the power down and subtracting 1 from the power. And this is 2 over 3x to the 1 third plus 2 over 3x to the 4 thirds. So if you need to pause the video for a minute here and just double check how I got this, go ahead and do that. And now I'm going to set this equal to 0. And when I set it equal to 0, I get 2 over 3x to the 1 third must be equal to negative 2 over 3x to the 4 thirds. And I'm going to cross multiply. So 2 times 3x to the 4 thirds is 6x to the 4 thirds. And that must be equal to negative 2 times 3x to the 1 third, which is negative 6x to the 1 third. I can divide both sides by 6. And then I can add x to the 1 third to the both sides. And then from here, I can factor out x to the 1 third, which might seem very strange. But when I factor that out, I'm going to get x plus 1. So let's just be clear, when you factor out x to the 1 third, you are subtracting 1 third from the power. So this becomes the first power. And when you subtract 1 third from this power, it becomes x to the 0, which is 1. And now we know this will be true if x equals 0 or if x equals negative 1. All right, so these are possible critical numbers. And then we also need to consider when will the derivative not exist? Well, it will not exist if x equals 0. Because again, here you can see if you plug in 0, you're dividing by 0. So 0 comes up yet again. So now we need to state what are our critical numbers? Well, remember in the very beginning, we said no matter what happens in this problem, x cannot be 0. In other words, x equals 0 is not in the domain. So no matter what happens with 0 later on, it cannot be a critical number because it's not in the domain. So what that means is your only critical number for this function is negative 1. And that concludes this video lesson.